So I want to talk with you uh, today about gamification and open source, which is um, the intersection of two topics that I am very passionate about. So in the run-up you know, to today's discussion, I thought to myself, you know, let's, what, what actually is open source and how do people view it and what are you know, some of the definitional concepts that actually uh, you know, move the space forward? And so you know, for many people, open source is a type of software. It represents a sort of category of, of software products uh, that they can point to and say it's open source. Um, for other people, it's a framework for developer collaboration. So they view the main kind of thrust and value of the open source community as the way that it brings to developers together to create products, a sort of uh, you know, early uh, form of international collaboration and crowdsourcing. And for some people, open source is a political movement. And as somebody who's not you know, deeply embedded in the open source world, I hear the sort of hallmarks of political thought and dialogue in what people say all the time. I mean, even the word freedom, of course, a very, very loaded word. I'm especially fond, by the way, of this photo as a as a, a barometer of the political power of open source. It is from a um, protest in Spain where you could at 8 p.m. choose from either going to an open source discussion or yoga, uh, which I think is incredibly apropos. Um, you can salute the sun while also talking about freedom of software. Um, but here's a question for you, which is the character who's, you know, and I love Jim's talk, by the way, it's actually super apropos for me, but Here's the, there's a person who's often not in the discussion about open source, who isn't represented in the discussion about open source, who isn't in those charts about the astonishing growth and movement of Linux, which is the end user. And what is it that the end user thinks about open source? Why do they care about open source? Is it about being cheaper? Is it about giving like some company the finger? I know it actually says fuck Apple up on the slides um, if you can't see them. No, no, I'm not, I'm not fucking Apple. Just for clarity. But I don't know, you know, at different years, it's, it's Oracle, it's Microsoft, whoever the enemy is right now. Does this drive end users to care about open source? Certainly some of my friends are driven to take Android phones because they don't want Apple to have, you know, their information or, or money or what have. Um, but despite the fact that we interact with software and we consume software more often than we consume food, basically, as people, well, at least most Americans, um, you know, uh, we nonetheless don't find open source rising to the level of an easily understood ingredient brand that demarcates a type of product for end users. Think about fair trade, organic, union made, made in the USA. These are core concepts that define a type of product or service with an ingredient value. All of those products are less meaningful and important than the software we are using a thousand times a day, and yet, we do not rise to this level in most consumers' minds. We do not have this aspirational product and brand identity. And the real question that goes before that is, are end users engaged with the concept of open source software? I know you are. You made the time to come to Portland and come to OSCON and read about it and talk about it and make it your life's work. But are the planet seven plus billion people engaged with open source? When we say engagement, what do we actually mean? Well, so a concept that we use on the game side is this definition of engagement, which uses five key metrics to define that. Think of it as a score. Recency, frequency, duration, virality, and ratings together give us a composite picture of whether or not somebody's engaged with a product, service, or idea. And I would posit that to a great extent, most of the work that we have to do is about raising the engagement of end users. Because if we raise the engagement of end users, maybe we can make them care about the same things that we care about. Maybe we can show them why it's important en masse to care about the things that we care about. In order to do that, I wanna bring you some lessons from the games industry. I think these are the important things to understand. And at the heart of it, the most important thing about gamification, about games, is this concept of user motivation. What motivates somebody to get up in the morning and do something? What drives them to care about a topic like open source and make choices in favor of open source software? This is the question, this is the crux of driving the engagement and driving end user support um, for the ideas and things that we're building. This term, I bandied around a couple of times, I'm sure you've read about it, I'm sure you have an opinion about gamification, and if you wanna explore that in greater detail, we have a session just after the break that goes into gamification in greater depth. In a nutshell, gamification is a process of using game thinking and game mechanics to engage audiences and solve problems. 
It's about unpacking what's important and meaningful about games to drive end user behavior, to create um, the kind of engagement that we need in order to advance open source to the next level, to make open source the next organic or fair trade of our time. Uh, just by way of brief introduction, I'm Gabe Zickerman. I'm the author of two books on gamification, including uh, the recently uh, released in digital form, Gamification by Design, which is published by O'Reilly. Um, I help lots of companies, big and small, uh, figure out how to use game techniques uh, and game concepts to you know, enhance their brands. And I'm also the chair of this uh, awesome event in September called Gamification Summit in New York, which brings together people from all these different walks of life, health, education, government, industry, to talk about gamification. All right, so I wanna share with you two great examples of game thinking and a couple of tips that you can take away if you can't join us after the break to talk about this subject in more depth. And these are some examples of game thinking used in lateral ways that you can think about and apply in your product, service, or platform that you're working on. And this is one of my favorite examples. This is called Speed Camera Lottery. I'm sure most of you are familiar with the concept of a speed camera that takes the picture of your car if you're speeding and sends you one of those nasty tickets in the mail. Well, in Scandinavia, uh, in many Scandinavian countries, the ticket is not based on how fast you're driving, but actually on how much money you make. So the more money you make, the bigger the ticket, right? It actually makes a lot of sense if you think about it, but that's, that's the design. So Kevin Richardson uh, from MTV, an awesome uh, game designer who will be speaking at Gamification Summit in the fall, um, entered and won this contest to design this thing called Speed Camera Lottery. And here's how it works. It's fucking brilliant. Instead of taking your picture, if you'd speed, as you pass by and sending you this bill in the mail, anybody who drives by the speeding camera at or below the speed limit is entered into a lottery to split the proceeds of the people who speed. Right? Right? It's awesome. It's awesome. It's a pure type of game thinking, that concept I described on an earlier slide. Take this big, negative, crazy reinforcement loop and break it down into a series of smaller, positively reinforcing behaviors to get people to change what they do. Speed camera lottery, by the way, not just an awesome idea, a 20% reduction in speeding at the intervention point. Which, by the way, yes, it's awesome. Thousands of lives saved in the United States if we delivered it. And Sweden has decided to deploy it across the country because it's been so effective in its test model in, in Stockholm. And it's, it's just, an amazing, uh, just an amazing, amazing thing. Another example, weirdly automotively related, but this isn't, you know, automotive is not necessarily the category that we, uh, where the best examples are, but this is just a fun one for me. Today, you cannot deploy a hybrid or electric, all electric vehicle basically into the market without building some kind of game into the dashboard, which to me is an awesome innovation. So most of these games are based on a, a virtual pet design like Tamagotchi, if any of you have ever played Tamagotchi. And so basically the idea is the more ecologically you drive, the more this thing grows, right? The more this usually a plant, especially in the Ford model, this plant is on your dashboard and it grows lusher and thicker and richer and more vibrant as you, grow, as you drive more ecologically. And if you start driving poorly, it starts withering and dying and, and fading out. <laughs> and what's super interesting about this use of game concepts in dashing cars is that consider the player of the car, the, the user of the car, the player of these games has already bought the car. The car manufacturers did not put this product in to get people, ostensibly, to get people to buy more cars. It's to raise their engagement with the car they already own. It's not always about getting somebody to make a, buy a product. Sometimes it's about making them feel better and be more engaged with the product that they already own. And that's been a brilliant kind of thing that the auto industry and completely sort of spontaneously has decided to unpack. For those of you who have a Nissan Leaf all electric vehicle, you'll note that your car has a Facebook connected driving game uh, in case you want to compare how you drive against your friends. I'm not sure people want to see how I drive. But here are some, I want to give you some practical concepts that you can take away and, and that you can go and, and apply to your projects uh, today. So one of the projects that you can get involved with on the open source side of gamification is Mozilla's Open Badges project. It is an open source project to bring uh, gamification elements to the world. Um, it's pretty limited in its current form. It's about badges, which gamification is not just about badges. We'll talk about that after the break. But um, it is a great start, and they're working on cool stuff in education. You can get involved uh, with the Mozilla Foundation, the Open Badges. If you actually deploy a product or service that targets consumers, you can bake gamification elements and at minimum the thinking about how to engage users using fun into your products or services from the beginning. And I highly recommend that you do that because it makes people happy. Um, 
You can also consider some of the basic foundational concepts about what makes games work. So one of those, one of those frameworks uh, that we talk about is called SAPS, and this is what consumers actually want, what drives behavior, what rewards motivate end users, and we talk about status, access, power, and stuff as being the things, the, the rewards that consumers actually want. And th that list is in order for you of most engaging to least engaging, and also in order of free to most expensive, which is a very interesting connection. This is one of the few times that marketing and product design and consumer desire dovetail well with the worldview in which people should pay as little as possible for things in the world. Status systems are mostly things that don't require you to have millions of dollars in the bank to give away freebies and give stuff away and give people discounts and give them gift cards. But these are things that are incredibly powerful and motivational and drive user behavior. And again, after the break, we'll, um, we're going to dig into them some more. And one more thing, which is a personal, this is my personal soapbox about most open source software, where we have most of our gap in terms of beauty and amazingness um, uh, for end users is really around the onboarding experience of most open source software. You know that first minute when somebody installs and starts running your application, that first minute decides whether or not they're gonna use your product. And when you're building things for the developer audience, they have a much higher tolerance for wading through the bullshit of the first minute of most open source projects. But for end users, that first minute is critical. And game designers have managed to perfect that first minute in a way that's both rewarding and motivational and instructional. And I encourage you, I know this is crazy, but I'm gonna encourage you to go out and play social games like Farmville and Frontierville on, on uh, Facebook from Zynga so that you can see what a well-functioning onboarding experience is like. And I'm just gonna point it out to you. This is the opening screen from Frontierville. It's kind of a thing of beauty, okay? So you launch the game and you come to the screen and, you, and it says, howdy, they call me Frontier Jack. Let's start by digging up the square with the yellow arrow pointing, pointing at it. What do you think the user thinks they should do at this moment? Guess what, guys? The only thing they fucking can do is click on that square under the yellow arrow. <laughs> it's not just obvious, it's impossible to mess it up. I mean, no, no, really. Think about this, it's impossible to mess it up. There's not even a username that's already taken. There's no way for the user to have a bad experience. Everything has been unpacked so that first minute is beautiful and amazing and reveals the, sorry, reveals the complexity of the system to the user in a way that they can manage complexity. They can absorb and understand that complexity and feel like they're accomplishing something. So you know what happens when you click on that square under the yellow arrow? The game goes, yay, you're awesome. It, it's something that most of us say, okay, well, that seems kind of banal or stupid or something that we don't really care about and doesn't matter. But you know what? People need little positive reinforcements in their lives to move forward. And it's actually a thing of beauty how well that yay behavior motivates end users. And what comes right after that yay? The game says, wanna do a little more? Wanna try a little more? Here's just one more challenge. Yay, you did it! Now invite some friends, right? And that's the sort of... <laughs> That's basically the model. Um, so there's a lot to learn from onboarding, and it's just one of the kind of core tenets of gamification game design that we can apply to all of our products, services, and ideas, no matter who it is that we're targeting, no matter what they're doing. And so fundamentally, I want to encourage you as much as possible to remember the customer in everything that we do for all the beautiful things that the open source community has done, all the amazing energy and momentum, the transformative power of what you do every single day, I want to encourage you as much as possible to remember the end user. Remember that their engagement, their support, their money, their time, their eyeballs are what enable us fundamentally to all be here, no matter what product it is that you work on, and that by using some of the techniques of fun and engagement, we can advance our cause in a way that's more powerful and more meaningful and farther reaching than ever before. So I want to thank you very much. If you'd like to uh, keep in touch with me, you can text 6EASY uh, to intro. Um, come to the, uh, my session after uh, 10.30, and anytime you'd like to talk to me, if you, if you send a text, you'll get my contact info. Um, anytime you'd like to talk about gamification or other subjects, by all means. Thank you very much.